Hey everyone, thanks for checking out the video. Today I'm going to help you deal with this disk too slow or system overload warning that happens sometimes in logic. If you're getting this error, it's because you're using too much processing power and your computer can't keep up. I know a few tips and tricks that'll help, so hopefully by the end of this video you'll understand how to get rid of the error and be back to doing something a lot more fun and creative. Let's get started. The first thing I'm going to show you today is simply how to view the performance meter within Logic. This will help you know where your computer's at at any given time, and so you can start to make adjustments based on that. If you go up here to this LCD screen and click the drop down arrow, these are different options of what you can see. And I like to leave mine on custom because you get this CPU section. And if you double click right here on the bar, it'll pull up this nice performance meter for you. And sometimes when I'm pushing heavy sessions, I like to just leave this open so I know what's going on. So by default, I'm not pushing that hard, but if I start playing my session, you'll see that jump up a lot. See, I'm getting peaks already around 50%. And so we'll go through a few things that'll help to combat that. The first thing to look for is your IO buffer size. That can be found in Logic Pro, Preferences, and Audio. If you've not seen this screen before, this is where you can change your audio device, switch between an interface or built-in speakers. Right below it is this IO buffer size. And what this does is tells the computer how quickly it needs to get audio in and back out to you as the listener. With a low buffer size, you get a very quick round trip latency and a very quick output. So this is great for recording because you need to get the sound in and back out to your monitoring situation very quickly so you don't feel any delay. But this takes more processing power to do this. So if you're not recording, put this up to 1024. This is going to result in higher latency, but when you're mixing, it doesn't matter as much. And so you'll be able to save processing power and use it for more important things like plugins and all of that processing. If you're not already on 1024, go ahead and put it there. But if you're doing something where you need that quick response with the audio, keep that lower. And sometimes you can get away with somewhere like 128. That's only a 9.1 millisecond round trip. And so that's not too bad. But if you start to feel it, then you'll just need to knock it up a little higher. But definitely on the mixing stage, get it as high as you can because the latency isn't going to affect you as the mixer. When you're done there, you can hit apply and you're good. You might get a pinwheel. Yep. You're going to want to check that first, definitely, because that's one of the easiest things to change. Next is to use more sends than inserts. Inserts are these up here where you put a plugin in the chain. You know, if you want an EQ boom, it's on the channel as an insert. It's in the audio is going to go through this. You've inserted it into the chain. However, you can also put plugins on sends, which is this lower section here. In this instance, a lot of my kind of orchestral instruments, things I want to sound like they're in the room, I've sent them all to this bus one, and that can be found over here. Bus one, and I have a reverb on that. If I were to, instead of using a send, if I were to put an insert on every single channel with reverb, it's going to max out my CPU in no time. Actually, let's try it. So I'm going to go to every channel in the mix here and add a reverb. Okay, now every single channel has a reverb. You can see already it spiked a little bit when I did that. But then when I hit play, it's going to be a lot more processing than before. Also, this sounds terrible. <laughs> so that's already pushing a lot higher, a lot more processing. I know when I was starting out, I thought the way to add reverb was as an insert, but that's not usually the case. Occasionally, there'll be a need for a really specific reverb or delay on that channel, like maybe a dotted eighth on a guitar. But for the most part, put it on a send. It's also easier to deal with because then you get a master volume for your reverb or your delay, and you won't be needing to go to each individual channel and change those parameters. And you're not limited to reverb with this. You can put 
whatever you want. So in this one, I have a decapitator. It's kind of an overdrive distortion plugin. And I knew I was going to want to send a few things to it. So I went ahead and put it over there to save my CPU. I'm sending like some synth bass over there. Um, actually, just two things. I'm sending a sub pulse and like an analog synth bass kind of thing. But all of those things add up and help save your CPU. Another thing you can do, this is especially helpful for when you're using a lot of MIDI, but you can commit or bounce something in place. This will essentially take your MIDI file, or you could do it with audio too. Anything that's using a lot of processing, you can actually print or burn that processing into the audio and create a new track without those effects on the insert, but instead they're inside the audio. And once you've done that, you're no longer using that plugin every time you play because it's in the audio. As an example, I'll show you with this damaged drum kit. Uh, by itself, it sounds like this. Okay, so what you can do with this is right click, bounce in place. So that's under bounce and join, bounce in place. And it's gonna ask you some stuff here. You can rename it. So the BIP stands for bounce in place. I'll leave it as that. And then you can say, hey, make the destination on a new track. Or if I had created a track and selected it before I did this, I could pick selected track. I usually like to just generate the new track here because it's quicker and easier. And then it'll ask you what you want to do with the source, which is what's being bounced. So in this case, the source is that channel with the MIDI on it. We have the option to leave it, mute it, or delete it. I definitely want to leave it because this is just an example, but we can mute it so that we're hearing the new one. Right here, if you want to bypass effects plugins, I don't want to do that. I don't have any effects plugins, but I don't want to do that in this instance. And then do you want to include the audio tail? So that's after the audio stops, kind of that throw, any reverb, any release that's happening on that. And then do you want to include the audio tail in the region? Yeah, we want to do that. And then any volume and pan automation, do you want to include that? And so we do want to include that. Right here, um, you got to watch out that you're not normalizing it because in most contexts, you're not going to want to make it any louder. So you can either set it to off or overload protection only. Overload protection would be if, it, if it's clipping, but I know that this isn't clipping because it's my session. So I'm just going to leave it on overload protection only. And we're going to hit OK. And it's going to run through the whole thing. OK. And now we got a new file. Now you'll notice that the volume on this new file is set to Unity, even though the volume on our old one was minus 7.4. The reason for this is because it has printed the volume information onto the new file. So even though this fader is higher, it's been printed at minus 7.4. And so then it starts you back at Unity with those changes in the file itself. And then if we hit play, it will hear that it's the same thing. And then if you wanna unmute these, the hotkey for that is Control M. When you're all done with that, you get a carbon copy audio file of whatever you've bounced in place. This is awesome because as you're going, if you decide that's good, I'm not going to make any other kind of creative changes to it, bounce it in place, delete your old track, you're saving CPU. You can do this as much as you want through the mix, but it is called committing because you can't go back. You can keep the old track there, but you're not saving as much CPU that way. Things to think about. Use it if it's helpful. The next thing I want to show you is called freezing tracks. And this is similar to committing, but it's not permanent. And it doesn't save as much CPU. But it's still a great option, and then it allows you to go back and make changes later. So by default, you're not going to see the option to freeze your track. You actually have to right-click on the tracks and go to Track Header Components. And right here, you're going to look for this fifth one down. It's called Freeze. Once you click that, you get this little icicle. And you can click as many as you want and nothing's going to happen. But as soon as you hit play, it's going to say, hold on, we got to freeze these. And it's just going to run through and freeze them all in place. Once it's done, you're done. Your CPU is going to calm back down. And then you're able to play your session like no big deal. 
But when you want to go make a change, oh, you can actually change sends. That's nice. But you cannot add, see when I try to go add an audio effect here, I get the little frozen thing. It won't let me change it. Um, you have to unfreeze to go in and change those things. But that's a great way to save CPU and not hard commit to your changes. And when you're ready to unfreeze, you just click it. It does a little thing and then you're good to go. But you can already see it's using more processing. So that's another great option for you to save CPU as you go. The last thing I want to talk about, and this is more of a bonus tip, but use lighter plugins. You don't always have to grab the coolest, most colored analog EQ. If I were to go through and load up all these channels with a really heavy EQ, whether it's like something from Waves or like FabFilter, it's going to tax my CPU more. If it's just a simple task, like you're rolling off a little bit of lows from something, or you just want to cut some mids, just use the regular channel EQ. It's also quick and easy to get to. You just click that thumbnail right there. It's going to save you CPU in the long run. Not to say you can never use your heavier EQs because there's a place for those. They, they could sound better. They could add their own color, but especially for things like, you know, if you're just EQing a little shaker that's way in the back, like no one's going to be mad about you not using the SSL EQ for that. So you can use your regular EQ for that, and it could also help. Same for compression. The Logic compressor is super lightweight. It's not going to kill your CPU. Another thing you can do, and I did it a lot in this particular session, is create track stacks, which are groups of a lot of channels going to one bus as an output, and then you can apply processing to that bus as a whole. For the drums, for example, all the percussion, so I've got my main damage kit, I've got auxiliary percussion, rise and hit, timpani, like a lot of stuff is happening here. Um, and I wanted to do almost nothing on the EQ. And so instead of putting this EQ on every channel, I decided to send them all to a bus, a track stack, and just put one EQ on it. And that's doing the job of, you know, eight or nine EQs here, plus the compression as well. So this one track stack right here is essentially saving me from using like 16 individual plugins. That's another thing to think about as you go. This might not always work because you might want to do things to tracks individually. So just something else to keep in mind. That wraps up the video for dealing with the disk too slow or system overload warning in Logic. If this was helpful or you have any other questions, feel free to let me know in the comments. Also, please make sure you like and subscribe. And if you'd like a video teaching more Logic tips and tricks, I have one right here you can check out. Thanks so much and have a great day.